I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani and today I have with me my colleague Suyash Desai and we're going to be talking about a new report that Suyash has authored which looks at civilian and military developments in Tibet. This is a really really interesting document because it brings together a host of different aspects uh, which have been scattered all across the place and which are relevant from an Indian security point of view uh, and I think Suyash talks about uh, civilian developments in terms of personnel changes, infrastructure development, uh, border village development. He also talks about military developments with regards to, again, infrastructure, installations, exercises, and of course, personnel. So we'll do a deep dive into this uh, document and uh, hopefully Suyash can shed some light on what was the process and what are the key findings. Uh, So Suyash, welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, It's good to be back on All Things Policy. It's been a while that we both have recorded a podcast together. So yeah, good to be back together as well. Yeah, it's been quite some time that I uh, did these episodes. Okay, so let's just uh, go to the sort of beginning, right, before we start going into the details of the document. The first question that I have is that, uh, what did you sort of begin with? What was the purpose of putting this document together? And uh, you know, so what was the driving factor for looking at these different dimensions and then bringing them all together? So Manoj, if I remember correctly, it was our conversations in 2020 that something is happening in Tibet. So end of 2020 is when the standoff had already started and uh, there were some reports regarding militia units being formed. So we were, both of us were having conversations that something is happening in Tibet and there are implications for India. This, this research, this area has to be looked at more carefully. And uh, when we uh, when I started deep diving into the research, I realized that similar documents, there was no similar document or there was no similar research for almost 10, 12 years. So most of the things were outdated. And 10 to 12 years is a long time because uh, Xi Jinping, it was before Xi Jinping and after Xi Jinping came, a lot of things have started changing as the document points out. Then the immediate trigger point was when, so we had already started looking into it, we had discussing, we had started reading the literature, but the immediate trigger point was the 14th five-year plan, which came out in March, I think, yes, it came out in March, and there was a lot of emphasis on infrastructure, and that is when we started studying the document for a purpose of the document, studying the area for a purpose of a document. Before that, we were reading the literature, understanding, trying to understand what is happening and what what are the implications for India because we are in a standoff. But the immediate trigger point was uh, was the 14 five-year plan. So the drivers for this document basically were to understand the changes that have happened in the past 10 years. So we started with understanding the changes after Xi Jinping came to power. But while doing the document, we realized that it's not only since Xi Jinping, Yes, things have started, uh, the speed has increased since Xi Jinping came to power, but since changes are happening in, since uh, 1999, when there was a change of strategy towards the peripheral part, China's change of strategy towards the peripheral part. So the implic- uh, drivers were to understand what is happening since past 20 years, what has happened since Xi Jinping came to power, and to understand how it will impact India, because a lot of things since, since Xi Jinping came to power have implications on the on India, on Indian security. So these were the broad drivers to understand the study or the broad drivers why we did the study. Also, the also some things that helped were, for example, Professor Fravel's tweet regarding Shao Kong villages, Raji Rajgopalan's document regarding military installation, or uh, Dr. Frank O'Donnell's document regarding military installations. So these things were periodically telling us that something is happening, but uh, we basically needed something to bring all of it together and understand and analyze from an Indian point of view, because we are in a standoff. Right. So let's just look at, you know, you mentioned a few of the sort of uh, pieces that were published, a few of the sort of points that others had noted, which 
prompted uh, you to start looking at this domain. Uh, I want to also get into the sources that you've tapped into because this is not necessarily driven by secondary sources and secondary analysis, right? So just give us a little bit of a sense of what are the kind of sources that you've looked at. So secondary sources played an important role in the beginning. So we started looking at the area from what others have analyzed. But as I've already pointed out, there was a gap in serious document or a long form document about this area. While researching, we also started looking at work reports. So basically, a work report is an annual thing that China comes out at the central level. While researching, I also understood that there are also provincial work reports. And uh, Tibet Autonomous Region or the Tibetan province has its own work report. So the primary source or primary uh, document through which we analyzed a lot of things was based on 15 to 20 work reports that are available in public domain, I think from 2005 or 2006 to 2021. So these are long documents, which basically work reports are long documents, which basically tell us what China has done in the past year and what China is doing in the next year, what China is planning to do in the next year. And so the, these these documents played an important role in understanding what has happened and what has what is China planning to do and whether that is achieved in the next year based on the next year's work report. So that is one part of it. Secondary document we have already highlighted. A lot of interviews, not only by Xi Jinping, but a lot of interviews by uh, other members of CCP, especially those who are related to Tibet. A lot of interviews, a lot of speeches by their provincial leaders and provincial Tibetan committee. So based on the, and all these, so for example, work report, leader speeches, lead documents from the provincial, other documents from the provincial government, all those are in Chinese language. And then also uh, other work that people have done in security and infrastructure on Tibet, uh, Western, Indian, Eastern scholars, all of them. So put together, we get a broad understanding of what has happened and then your analysis come into play. This is basically the last. Right. So I, I think the one big takeaway that I have from this is that, you know, there is actually a lot of material that uh, is available, at least uh, online in terms of what the government says that it plans to do and also what the government says that it's achieved. You know, obviously, some of these some of this data needs to be subsequently corroborated and there is only a limited amount of work that one can do to corroborate them, particularly when you don't have access to uh, these places physically. But to be able to just gather through all of them uh, and put together what the government says it wants to do, what it has achieved and what independent reports may have corroborated of achievement. I think that's uh, in itself quite a useful exercise. Of course, uh, there's no no replacement to actually, you know, looking at independent data because government data can also be very fuzzy in China. But it's a great place to, you know, have a starting point of what at least the government is saying, whether it's provincial government, local government or the central government about what is the kind of plan, what are the kind of plans that they have and what they have achieved. So it's fascinating. I mean, it's really great. Just one point, Manoj, unlike popular belief, a lot of data is available on all the three levels of government. So it's just that it's untapped. So if someone decides to deep dive into it, there is a lot that can be made out of it and across China. So that is something interesting that was my takeaway from this while working on this document. Fascinating. All right. So we'll take a quick break before we come back and then we'll start looking at the details of the document. So do join us after this quick break. Do you like true crime stories? Do you like to learn about the people behind some horrible, awful crimes? More specifically, women that may have committed these crimes. Actually, Indian criminals that are women? Then we'd like to welcome you to our podcast, Misconduct. My name is Raghavi. And I am Nisha. We cover themes like murder, decoity, drug trafficking, financial fraud, kidnapping, and many more. You can catch us every Wednesday on the IVM Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcast. Hello and welcome back to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Kevalramani and I have with me my colleague Suyash Desai and we are talking about his new research which looks at civilian and military developments in Tibet under Xi Jinping. So Suyash, in the first sort of bit before the break, we spoke about the kind of, uh, you know, what what your drivers for for researching this particular domain uh, and what were the different sources that you tapped to try and bring all this together. So let's now look at exactly what you found, right? 
So let's begin with sort of uh, the uh, personnel changes that have taken place in Tibet over the last uh, eight, nine years since Xi Jinping has been in power. Uh, so just give us a little bit of a lay of who is currently running the show uh, at, a, at a party level and what are the personnel changes in the military too? So very recently, the change that has taken place is someone called Wang Chun Chun, who is the head of the province right now. But the document doesn't look into what he has done because he's come just one month before today with a document coming out or one month before recording this podcast. So majorly, we look at past 10 years and the provincial leaders in Tibet and under their rule, what has happened. So we start looking at from Chen Kwan Cho, who came to Tibet in 2011 or 12, 2011, I think, but before she and two important things he did in Tibet. One is smaller convenience police station. And second is grid style management. Basically, to sum it in what these two things are, basically, these are improving the surveillance area, block side as block side surveillance, improving the surveillance within deeper parts of Tibet. That is basically what he did. Then uh, Wu, Wu Inza, who was the very recent provincial leader in Tibet, he took a book or he took a leaf out of Chan's book and continued what Chan had implemented and he went ahead with something called as military style vocational training. So what is military style vocational training? Military style vocational training is you pick up people uh, from every household and send them for vocational training in different different areas. There you train them. This is a bit different than the vocational training that they quote unquote vocational training that they uh, do in Xinjiang. Here, they train them in developing different, different abilities, uh, abilities, military abilities, as well as general abilities in a coercive manner, of course. And then there is a possibility that from them, some recruitment takes place in border area. But I'm not going into that. I'm going to talk about that in the military section. But there is a stringency or coercion attached to this, which is similar in, similar to what is happening in Xinjiang. So these these two, three things were done in the past 10 years to implement quote-unquote discipline within Tibetans and to train them according to the dictates of the party. So, Chan Kwan Cho and Wu Yingsa, these are two important players. Uh, Wu Yingsa retired recently, as I've pointed out in the document, and Wang Chu Cheng is now taken over as a provincial leader. Let's see what happens there. But these two, uh, these two played an important role. And Wu Ying is especially important because Shao Kong villages or the border, well of border villages, which have an implication, which are almost completed or completed, we don't know the latest status, but which have an implication for sec- border security or border dispute with India. These were largely made or completely made under his tenure. Of course, there was a central funding, central the guidance through this, but it was made under his tenure. So that he is an important player uh, in what has happened in the past 10 years. Can you just explain what exactly is a Xiaokang village? Because uh, I'm sure a lot of listeners would firstly not be familiar with the term, uh, but also what is it and why would it matter to India? So Xiaokang, so we share a long border with China. Similarly, Bhutan also shares a border with China and Nepal shares a boundary with China. So what China is doing is they are constructing permanent settlements on the borders with India, on the borders with Bhutan and on the boundaries with Nepal. So when I say borders with India and borders with Bhutan, uh, some of our borders are not marked. So invariably, some of these villages come within Bhutan, they come within India and it creates a problem. Now, why they are doing it? One good example of it is to we have to go back to the four or five agreements that we have signed from 1993 to 2013 with China. Uh, I think the 2005 agreement, there is a there is a point which says that the border villages or the border settlement should be taken into consideration before marking the boundary or their well-being should be taken into consideration. This is in India-China 2005 agreement. Uh, so, by creating permanent infrastructure on the border, and it, these are not just permanent infrastructure, these are big households 
a village of 100 households for example they are connected with electricity they are connected they are connecting it with internet regular facilities shifting tibetians and other chinese from china proper to these villages creating permanent settlement will help china to assert sovereignty over the disputed regions on the border that's point number 1 point number 2 these households will also act as a watch post for what is happening on the boundary and borders that's point number 2 and 3 this is a very limited point but there is a cross by border migration so not uh, limited from india's point but also a lot of migration that takes place from tibet to india so these households will also or these watch posts we also help them to limit the cross border migration but majorly it has to deal with asserting sovereignty and claiming those areas it is very similar to what china is doing in south china sea uh, a salami slicing activity where you build land, territories you grow vegetation you add include settlement on those islands within the sea and then you have a legal right to claim it so legally and by force they, it's two birds in one stone kind of a thing where you do something which helps you legally as well as while applying force so china uh, there is a prop dispute in number but china is building i think 604 or 628 border villages across boundaries and borders with nepal india and bhutan and uh, most of them are or the two third of them are are with arunachal pradesh but they are building it from kotan to ninch the whole border i just wanted to add uh, one sort of follow up question uh, firstly before i add the question uh, for folks who are interested the agreement that suresh is talking about uh, is the 2005 uh, agreement uh, on uh, the political parameters and guiding principles uh, for the settlement of the india china boundary question article 7 of that agreement says that uh, you know in settling in reaching a boundary settlement the two sides shall safeguard due interests of their settled populations in the border areas so like suresh said right when you're settling new populations those will have to be factored into an eventual settlement suresh for the second question that i had which was for you was um, is uh, and there has been some controversy around this in india right uh, these villages are being built in areas that are already that are in dispute in terms of the boundary dispute with india in terms of india's territorial claims and china's territorial claims but this is these are areas which are currently under prc control right they are uh, governed under the prc control right they are not areas which have been taken away from uh, where india we used to control right correct correct so uh, at least in case of india these are villages that are in prc uh, the information that we know until now these are villages that are in prc's control in case of bhutan there have been a couple of incidents where these are the villages where which are built on bhutanese controlled territories a couple of incidences if i remember correctly but we there is a lack of information because we only know about 30 40 villages out of 600 villages that they are planning to build so we don't know what will happen in future if the past is is indicative of the future then most of this will come in prc uh, disputed areas which are in china's control but if uh, some there are some exceptions where they are in bhutan then it is going to be problematic because there is very little information occasionally a village there is a media report about a uh, village coming up in india in or what india claims to be its territory but it is under china currently but there is not a detail on ground report yet and also when china if you read chinese sources or chinese internet they claim that they are building in china so yeah it's a space that we are going there that should be studied going ahead and will create a lot of tensions between two countries i'm sure no fair enough fair enough and this also sort of prompts the uh, establishment in other countries to then sort of stake claims uh, and that can like you said create twisted tensions okay we'll move on from here uh, let's talk a little bit about the military leadership and the changes that have taken place in that because for the last uh, year at least we've seen tremendous uh, change at least in the leadership at the western theater command which has led to lots of speculation in india about you know whether this is linked to the standoff in ladakh or what exactly is so what have you found out about the military leadership so uh, right now from what we know wang hai chiang is the commander of western theater command he was also i think the commander of xinjiang military district li fan piao is the political commissar of western theater command we don't know who's the head of 
ground force. So basically, when you talk about force structure of a theater command, there is a head and there is a political commissar. These two are the most important of commanders or people in that theater command. Then there are individual service heads who are reporting to them. So for example, head of ground forces, head of air force, head of... Then the, in, in case of Western theater command, there are... Tibet, there is Tibet military district and there is Xinjiang military district. Both of them are important for India. Tibet military district because a large part of Indian territory shares the border with Tibet military district. That's why it is important. And Xinjiang military district is important because Xinjiang military district is where all the activities are taking place right now. So that is important. Uh, Lieutenant General, uh, so General is basically head of the command, head of the theater command or head of the service. Lieutenant General is basically either the head of the service under the theater command or head of the military district. So Lieutenant General Wan Kai right now is the head of the Tibet military district. General Kwang Tawang is the uh, head deputy commander under him, which will most likely be the next head of Tibet military district. Similarly, Liu Lin, an important name that Indians are quite aware of, who was the commander of Xinjiang, South Xinjiang military district is uh, with where the tussle is happening right now, is now the head of Xinjiang military district and so on and so forth. There are a lot of de- details in the tables. Uh, de- there are a lot of details in the document. I will not mention everything right now. But an important point to take, in, to take note of here is just structure of the theaters and military districts, both the military districts which is not very often highlighted when we talk about India, China, India, Tibet. So, as I've pointed out, Tibet military district and Xinjiang military district are important. Xinjiang military district is divided into three parts because it's a huge military district and that is why it was divided. And it was divided before she she came to power. So, it is divided into east, south and north. We have to deal with south because uh, the Ladakh part shares a boundary with South Xinjiang military district. Then the head, current head of South Xinjiang military district is unknown. But Liu Lin was the head when the standoff started. Tibet military district is divided into six sub-districts. These are Laza, Shigatsa, Ningche, Shanan, Chamdo and, and Nakchu. Of these six sub-districts, Ningche, Shanan and Shigatsa share a border with India. I think Ningcha and Shannon shares it with the Arunachal Pradesh state and Shigatsa also shares with Bhutan. In case of South Xinjiang military district, Nagari and Bhutan share the border with India. So, Hotan, uh, Nagari immediately and Bhutan on the head of Kashmir. So, these are all important things that we should remember while dealing with India-China border dispute. All right, that, that's fascinating. That's really useful details. Uh, and we'll, what we'll do is that we'll take another quick break uh, and then we'll come to the next part of this sort of conversation, which is about the infrastructure development. And you captured like really interesting details, not just about dumb infrastructure in terms of roads and things, railways, but also in terms of sort of uh, technology and connectivity. So we'll have a conversation about that as soon as we get back from this break. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. From Jeff Bezos to Amitabh Bachchan, everyone has tasted failure, but they don't give up. On Probation and Promotion, the Kabinov talks about failure and how to use it as a stepping stone towards your goals. On a show about crypto, Rohan and Jaspeet Bindra, founder of the Tech Whisperer, debate whether blockchain could be considered socialist in nature. On the longest constitution, Priyam Mazda sheds light on untouchability in the workplace with the help of Article 17. Witness the liberation of Bangladesh in the season finale of War and Warriors as narrated by Air Vice Marshal Arjun Subramaniam. And on Audio Gun, Kedar is joined by writer Himali Kothari. They talk about Project 87. This project focuses on English language plays from India. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Go check out our YouTube channels. We go live on a whole bunch of different things. We have a number of different channels. You can find them on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week. Fred, Bank of Baroda, CoinSwitch Kuber, Intel, and Oxfam India. Thank you for making this possible. Hi, folks. Uh, welcome back to All Things Policy. You've been listening to a conversation between me, Manoj Kewalgamani, and my colleague, Suyash Desai, uh, about civilian and military developments in Tibet, 
which are part of uh, a new document that we've published. Uh, Suresh, we've spoken about uh, the personnel changes and the relevance of all of this to India. Let's now quickly sort of have a conversation about infrastructure development, because that's been sort of this bane of comparison between India and China over a long period of time. And every time there's a confrontation on the border or there is tensions on the border, we talk about uh, how the Chinese have developed so much infrastructure that has uh, allowed them to mobilize very quickly. And currently, sort of while India is still catching up in terms of its border infrastructure, uh, you're seeing much more pressure, partly because of uh, you know improvements in border infrastructure in India. So let's just talk about the civilian and military infrastructure because it's difficult to separate these two in some ways. Uh, so what have you found uh, in your study? So basically, Manoj, civilian infrastructure is divided into three, four, five parts. Roads, airports, railways, uh, dams, internet connectivity, power grid, and oil. There is also Shaokang, but we have dealt with that already. So a road, basically, all of them as a plan, China started developing in 1999. That is when China started its Go West campaign, where it thought that their West was, the Western area was neglected. So it, it, it covers... 12, 13 provinces and Chongqing municipality. So they started focused development uh, towards these regions. Under this campaign, a lot of roads, earlier there, there, were, there were only two roads that were connecting Tibet to China proper, two or three roads that were connecting. Now they are increasing the number of all weather roads that are connecting to China proper to Tibet which is very important because all of them are not all weather roads. And as you know, because of the altitude, because of the climatic conditions, building an all weather road is very important. I'm not going into detail what are the road numbers, where it starts, where it ends, but just a broader picture. So one part of road is chi- connecting China proper to uh, Tibet. Second area of const- road construction or road network building is connecting important cities within Tibet. Lasha, Shigats, Shana, Ningche, up to a certain extent, even Rotog. So all these connecting important cities within Tibet. So intrastate network. Third important point is connecting Xinjiang to Tibet. So there is only one road there. I think trying to make another road which will connect Xinjiang to Tibet. Then fourth important point is connecting major cities to border. So uh, so for example, connecting Lhasa with different different important border points with Nepal, uh, with Bhutan, with the Indian border. And these are true, they, they are doing this with the help of state highways and provincial roads. Because provincial roads are very important. That are the crux of problem that India will have to look going ahead. But I'll come to that later. And the fifth part is parallel to bound parallel to boundary and border road. So they are connecting parallel uh, roads which are which could run parallel to the entire stretch from Rutok to Ningcha, which covers all three countries: India, China, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. So two such uh, highways they are building. So that is the fifth one, and sixth one is connecting Tibet to Nepal. So these are the broad network. There are a lot of details in the ta- in the table, and there are also good maps that Anish, our colleague at Akshashila Institution, has. Made. So I would encourage everyone to look at it. That's the road network part. In the in case of rail, rail network part, it is also fascinating. Uh, so we already know about the Uchinkai Tibet Railway, which is the first the railway network that connects uh, China to Tibet. They are also building uh, the Lhasa Shigat. Uh, they are also building Tibet Sichuan Express Bullet uh, Railway. Half of it is done. Uh, some part of uh, half of it is left, which they will complete by 2020. They claim to complete by 2020. These are the two known inter-provincial railways. Now they are building a lot of infrastructure, railway infrastructure, uh, intra-provincial infrastructure, connecting major cities in Tibet. And one important railway that I would particularly like to mention that we have discussed in a great detail, Manoj, is about Tibet-Xinjiang Railway. Uh, So they are connecting the southern part of Tibet. So Tibet, uh, Lhasa to southern part is already connected. Now they are connecting southern part of Tibet, running it parallel to the Indian border, India-China border, and taking that railway to uh, Hotan. We don't have details about whether this will pass through Aksai Chin or not. So we have kept that as it is. We have mentioned that we don't have details. But 
all Chinese literature or news reports say that it will follow the first Xinjiang uh, Tibet road. That is, I don't remember the number now, 319, I think, which went through Accession, but we don't have details about it. And if you see, we have a map of railway network in Tibet. If you see that, it's a loop that they are creating in Xinjiang, Qinghai and Tibet. So there is a constant connectivity. The arguments that are given are basically to improve the infrastructure, to improve infrastructure, there is economic growth, etc. But it has military relevance as well. So that's railways. In case of airports, Tibet already has 13 airports. Uh, 14th five-year plan, we have not mapped it on a map in the document. The 14th five-year plan claims that there would be 30 more airports in Tibet, but they have kept it very ambiguous. So 30 more in Tibet, that means all the areas that come under Tibet or only Tibet autonomous region. And 30 is a very big number. So uh, yeah, it is a space that will have a lot of developments going ahead. Then another uh, two, three other important areas are internet and power connectivity. And I will connect it to Shaokong villages because not only they are connecting the Tibet, uh, the Tibetan autonomous region with internet and power, they are also connecting, they are also empowering the Shaokong villages with internet and power facilities, which means again, permanent settlement. And the final area, uh, the second, uh, another area of importance is the all season oil pipeline. Now, some people may argue, scholars might argue that uh, all season pipeline is a seven development of 1970s. Yes, it was a development of 1970s, but it was small and it was it was having less cap- capacity. It was a pipeline to deliver fuel from Chinkai to Tibet. It was the only connectivity. It is still the only connectivity for delivering fuel from. So it is called lifeline of Tibet from Chinkai to Tibet. Uh, and there have been a there has been corrosion of pipes. So what, now what they are doing is they are creating a parallel pipeline next to this pipeline, which will be bigger, which will be longer, and which will be supported by fuel depots or oil depots at different different places. Uh, so this helps, of course, in economic growth of the region, but uh, there are military implications or strategic implications to this as well. The final section in the Tibetan infrastructure development part was regarding the dams so there has uh, there has uh, over the past two three years we have seen indian reports highlighting that china is creating dams on uh, brahmaputra river uh, so they call it yarlum sangpo in while re- studying it i realized that china has already created four dams on the upper reaches of yarlum sangpo Two of it were completed in 2015. Two, I think, were completed in 2020. And they are now focusing their area, uh, focusing their attention on the lower reaches, which will have geostrategic implications for India. So that 14th five-year plan specifically, for the first time, I think, highlighted uh, that lower reaches of uh, Yarlung Sangpo should be utilized for hydroelectric generation. And an uh, important point here to be noted is that we don't have water or data sharing agreement with uh, China. In case of India and Pakistan, there are data sharing, water sharing agreements. So non-existence of such agreements make such developments very complicated. Fantastic. That's a, that's a really detailed look uh, at the document. And I don't want to sort of dwell into details because like you said, I want people to actually go into Read the document. Um, my last question is that we, uh, you know, uh, what are the implications of all of this on India? So in part, you've answered some of this where you've said that, you know, salami slicing creates a new set of facts on the ground. Uh, and, you know, and as you're developing this inf- uh, sort of stuff, this infrastructure, there can be potentially greater, you know, mobilization, quicker mobilization. But does that fundamentally alter the security dynamic with India or, uh, you know, uh, a, it also allows India to sort of strike back in case of conflict, uh, particularly if needed, when you have these established lines of communication, which you can attack to, you know, stymie the PLA's advance. So just a, a quick thought on the implications for Indian security. Both, Manoj, both, but it gives an advantage because to them, because we are chasing their infrastructure. So we started developing our infrastructure when we realized that they have gone very ahead. So I remember Shamsarin's 2007 argument that we need to create some roads. Uh, they, their committee had identified uh, 60 plus 70 roads 
uh, that are of strategic importance. So we are chasing that. That's point number one. But in case of broader implications, as you have already highlighted, Shaokong villages, it will be on. It will be important because the salami slicing happens through them. Uh, all the roads are very important because they are very strategically built. So, for example. If uh, that's in the document, I will encourage everyone to read the document. But most of the important PLA locations, a road starts from that area and goes to the nearest border uh, point. A feeder road starts from that area and goes to the nearest border point, which is disputed. So what happens is that it helps the PLA in case of mobilization if there is an escalation. Also, uh, the cross or the inter-provincial roads are generally made. Yes, one can always argue that they are in, made to increase the connectivity between two provinces. But the provinces are also where the PLA headquarters is. So, for example, their 77 group army is located in one place. So, there is a road and a railway connecting the 77 group army to Tibet. Similarly, Hotan... Uh, so, for example, some roads that connect uh, Xinjiang to Tibet. Yes, you can, of course, argue that these are for establishing connectivity, but these are specifically made where two units of the PLA get better mobility. So, there is an argument regarding interstate connectivity, but military and strategic implications have to be taken into consideration. And feeder roads definitely are for that purpose. So, you develop every border point keeping into mind your nearest PLA location. So that will have implications for Indian security because it helps them to mobilize quickly. And if you compare it with India, uh, mobilization is still a concern. We are developing right now. We are developing our roads. Uh, Border Roads Organization is working right now, but we are chasing their infrastructure. That's the thing. So that's an important concern. Then airports, uh, it helps them in commissioning more and more or keeping more and more planes uh, in Tibet. Uh, so all these things have military implications on India in case of escalation going forward. Perfect. Okay. So that's, I think that's a perfect place for us to end for people to sort of, uh, for me to prompt people to go and uh, look at this document and take a look at uh, the kind of details uh, that we've put together, that Suez has put together. And I think it's going to be a really, really useful study for Indian scholars, Indian researchers, but also Indian policymakers to just grasp with the nature of the challenge that they are that we are faced with. And also, like you said, the 14th five-year plan talks about many more details. Uh, so there's much more building in this direction. And I think this is a great starting point for people to at least grasp the nature of the challenge that we face. Uh, thank you so much, Suresh. Thank you so much for these details. And thank you so much for the conversation. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website, takshashila.org.in. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor, Siddharth Deshmukh, and I'm back with season two of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10-minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says. 